This video is brought to you by Sailrite. Visit Sailrite.com for all your project supplies, tools, and instructions. In this tutorial video, we're going to show you every single step to reupholster a corner bench in a pontoon boat. This is what the old corner bench looked like, and when we're done, this is what the new one will look like. This video will cover making the backrest portion of this pontoon bench. Now we're going to be reusing the foam and we're going to be using the old vinyl as a pattern for the new vinyl. So this will not show any patterning for new foam. Let's get started. The first step is removing the old vinyl. Hi, I'm Eric Grant with Sailrite, and today we're going to reupholster this backrest for a pontoon boat. And as you can see, this is a backrest that fits into a corner. The first thing we need to do is remove the old vinyl and inspect the foam and the frame. To do that, on the bottom side there are staples. We will just remove all these staples. Some of them are so rusty they can probably just be pulled out. Depends on how old your seat is. By the way, before you take everything apart, you may want to take a few photos of the old chair so you can use those as a reference when you go to reassemble it. So this end has some shape built into it. They sewed it over the corner. I think I can still pull it down after I've got it, uh, the staples removed. Yeah, it looks like I can. And you can see this plastic over the top is uh, what's called a silk film. It helps to prevent water from getting to the uh, foam. It's a preventative uh, measure, and we're going to do the same thing. Okay, here there is a fabric pole between this bolster piece and the bottom piece. Uh, so we're going to have to remove the staples between this fabric pole. But let's get it off a little bit more so we can inspect it. So you can see the fabric poles stuffed between these two layers of foam. If I move this foam, we can get to it. Looks like they stapled the foam at this location here just to hold it in place. Yep. And staple it here in this corner. There we go. And now we can remove the staples uh, for this fabric pole. So now we have the fabric pole staples removed and we can remove the fabric completely from the frame. The frame actually looks like it's in pretty good shape. It's not totally waterlogged. Okay, after we take the silk film off, we need to inspect the foam and see if it's worth being replaced. It would save some money not to replace it and it would save a lot of labor as well. But this foam doesn't look to be in terrible shape. What I want to look for, what you want to look for, is major black spots or mold. And there is some over here. Actually, a closer look at this, and this is actually just dirt. So not bad. Um, so the next step is to inspect the foam and see if it needs replaced. This foam doesn't look that bad, and this lo looks like it might be a little bit of mold, but actually, if you peel it off, it's just dirt here. Now, this bottom piece, if we take the silk film off of it, which we haven't done yet, it has a lot more black mold in certain spots, I believe. Let's, let's see what it looks like. So the, the silk film in, at the corners and at a few spots has actually been glued just to hold it in place, so I'm carefully ripping it up. There we go. So if we don't replace this foam with the other seats that we made, we replace the foam there because the foam was in terrible shape. This one is not in terrible shape. It's acceptable, but it won't feel the same. And if you're okay with that, then you probably don't need to do the extra step of replacing the foam. It'll save a lot on labor and it'll save some money in the end. 
I am contemplating whether or not this piece should be redone. This is easy because this is just basically one rectangular piece of foam that just wraps around the frame. Um, I might replace this. I haven't decided yet. The frame's also not in that bad a shape. We might want to reinforce some of the sections of the frame, but you definitely want to remove all the old staples uh, before you start to, to um, re-upholster uh, it. You can see here, this frame probably could use a couple staples here. This is a little bit wet, by, but by the time we're done with the upholstery job, it'll hopefully be dried out. Okay, we kind of slipped the cover back on, not all the way, but we want to look at all these seams in it. Um, this seam, I'm like, why in the world did they put that in there? They probably put that in there just to save fabric. So I am going to basically put an X on this. I'm not going to create a seam there. This seam is required because there's shape. This seam's required. These are as well. That all takes the shape of the chair. Here on the sides, this is required. This is required because this is a separate strip of fabric. This is required because this is the side. Um, if you look at the back, back here, this seam comes up and comes down the back. That's required. Same thing with over here because there's shape in that. Seam down comes up and down the back. We're going to have that. Again, this one I'm not going to do, so I'm going to put an X on it. So I'm not going to tear it apart here. I'm going to try to use this fabric as my pattern. And because of that, I'm going to put some um, matchup marks on the material at specific spots. So it doesn't really matter where you put them, you just want to have some matchup marks so that you can make sure that things are lining up exactly how they were before. So at each one of these seams, we're going to put some marks. Now I'm going to put letters at uh, spots so that we know where some things line up. I don't have to put letters everywhere because of the fact that uh, if you match up some of the letters, you're going to know exactly where things go. All right, since we have everything uh, labeled with matchup marks and everything uh, labeled that way, we can take it off and we can start cutting this apart. The laborious task of Ripping up your seams is e more easily done with a seam ripper. Don't worry if you rip the fabric a little bit like I just did there. I'm a, I don't want to do that, but, uh, and I didn't do that intentionally actually, but uh, we can just piece that together. Okay, we're going to rip out all the seams except for the ones that we have, the only one seam for us that we have an X on where we don't want to join panels together to save fabric. As discussed earlier, we're going to use the old vinyl for patterning the new vinyl. Okay, we've laid all the panels out and you can see how important all these matchup marks that are labeled uh, are because it would be very difficult to figure this all out if you had not have done this. And right now it doesn't look like it's going to amount to anything at all, but it will in the end. Now, I can do repatterning of everything, but that's a lot of work. And we've already got the patterns basically on our old vinyl and it fit pretty well. So we're going to be using these to cut out our new fabric and we're going to be transferring all of these labels to the new fabric so that we can match it up again and sew it together. Now the old chair had a white piece and a tan piece. We are not going to do that. We're going to make both of these the cream color out of the Eversoft vinyl that's available from Sayerite. We're going to cut notches directly across from our, uh, pit, our marker marks. That way we can transfer the marks on the back side of the fabric pretty easily just by these notches or in this situation just slits because it's only our scrap fabric. Then we're going to take this and we're going to flip it over and we're going to nest it so that we get the best cloth usage. And you can see that we left the seam allowance on there. That's nice. We're going to make this the exact same size that it currently is. 
So when you trace around each one of these pieces, you need to make sure that you splay the seam allowance down flat. To keep the panel in place, I'm actually gonna put a, a weighted sandbag on here. That kind of keeps it from moving around. And then I'm gonna splay the seam out and just trace around it with my pencil. I'm on the back side of this Eversoft vinyl. So now we're gonna take those matchup marks that we cut, which is one right here, one right here, I believe that's it. I'm going to have to flip it over to make sure that that's true. So let's make sure we got them all. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. We got them all. And what we should do is we should label them now. This one is C. Make sure you label them appropriately. We're labeling on the back side. This one's D. Let's lift it up here. This one's O. in. Do not want to get this mixed up. And here I'll show you how you can get it mixed up. H. So let's say that you're do this. So now this would be C and that's not C and this is, you see how you can screw it up? So you got to make sure that you label it by lifting it up and looking. Okay, the next piece, it has so seam allowance here and here, but none here. This is actually stapled on. So I'm not gonna trace here. I'm gonna actually leave it a little bit long. I like to have a little bit longer everywhere it's been stapled. So I'm gonna nest it so I get my best cloth, cloth usage out of it. I think that will probably do well. It's kind of hard to tell unless you nest everything. But you can see I'm leaving excess fabric here. So that should do well. Oh, and I forgot to do the cut the cutouts. Let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to make them a little bit bigger so I can see them a little bit better. Lay it so that the uh, outside surface is facing the tabletop. And we'll trace around this and put our matchup marks on it too. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to actually just have it come down like this, but I am going to, um, whoops. I am going to show basically where it stopped. No, I don't need to show that. You don't need to, yeah. yeah. So the matchup marks are here and here on this piece. And we'll flip it up and label this one A and this one B. So though we left excess fabric down here to staple, I still want to mark where the bottom edge was sewing so that I know basically, hey, that's, that's where it was sewn. And, and if you want, you can put a staple. Okay, instead of making slits in the pattern, uh, we found that it was easier to actually just lift up the corner and then mark where that slit is and then mark where it's labeled. So after you're done tracing around the entire thing, uh, doing this was definitely easier because I don't have to look for my cut marks. And uh, then we labeled that K. I believe there's some, yeah, one over here. We did the same thing. We just lifted this up. We matched the mark up and then labeled it A. So there we are. We've got everything patterned for this color. We're gonna go ahead and cut all these out with our scissors right on the lines that we struck on the fabric. We'll just keep doing this to every pattern. There's our first one. So this is our maroon fabric and I have it on a maroon fabric as well. I'm going to go across the bias, which is typically not done, but 
I only got a yard of this fabric and this is fine. It's not a fabric that's going to stretch in any odd way. It's a very small piece and we're also going to make it into channeling. So the channeling will reinforce it as well. Um, let's look at it. It has a fabric pole on it. And so what I've done is I've marked fabric pole along the edge that it's, that it uh, is sewn to and also where the fabric pole stops here. So I did that on the opposite end as well. This fabric also has, if you flip it over to the right side, two seams sewn into it. And I've inspected it and made sure that this is just a flat piece of fabric, and it is. So what they did is they saved on fabric just by sewing seams at the corner. So these seams would match up with the corner of our white pieces underneath. But since we're doing channeling in this, we don't really want to sew in seams, and it's not necessary as long as we follow the shape of this piece. You notice that it is not a straight piece. It does have shape. So we're going to follow that shape. These seams we're not going to put in, and then we're going to sew channeling in. Now to sew channeling in, we need extra fabric to sew the channeling, because when you sew channeling, it shrinks up a little bit. So I actually have some extra fabric, not a lot on both sides. We laid it in here so that we could get more, as much fabric as we can out of this. I would like to cut it out of a bigger piece of fabric, but uh, I don't want to pull more off the shelf. So I've laid some sandbags on here just to keep it in the general spot. And now we're going to trace around the edge, making sure that our seam allowance, if it's folded up like this, is splayed out as we trace along that edge. So we lay it down flat and make sure that the seam allowance is splayed out. And we've already marked it uh, pretty much around the entire perimeter here. Ignore these marks. Uh, that was something we did by mistake. Now I'm going to lift it up and look for my marks here. Here's an eye. So it's right there. So we're going to label that eye. I'm, I'm using um, a lot better pencil here to mark the back side of the fabric. The, the regular pencil that you get, a, I'm going to say that again. I'm using the Scryball pencil black for vinyl. It's a lot better than just a regular number two pencil. Here's a mark here. We, this one's J. So I'm going to go down here and look for marks and make sure I transfer them to our, the back side of our vinyl. Okay, here's our fabric pole, and this is where the fabric pole ended, right here. So I'm going to lift that up, and I'll just try fabric pole ends, and I'll do the same thing on the other side. Okay, now we cut this exactly to the right size, and usually when I'm doing channeling or making my own channeling, I cut it oversize. But the reason I'm not doing it here is this channeling is has a lot of shape to it. Most channeling that has no shape to it. So I am cutting it almost verbatim to the size that it originally was so that I can make sure that my channels are perpendicular to the edge. Now here at this side, this is where it ends, but remember I, I want to try to keep it long. Uh, I'd rather have extra than too little, so I'm going to leave that little scrap on. We'll cut it off later. Okay, we realized that these marks are going to be basically be covered up with our sew foam when we sew our channeling in. So we'll have to transfer them to the channeling. So make sure you save your scrap pieces so that you could put them on this piece again after the sew foam's on. First, we're going to sew the lower panels. That's next. Okay, we've laid all the cut pieces on top of our foam and frame, as you can see here. And I've pinned it in a few spots in the seam allowance so there's no holes in the vinyl. So let's talk about how we're going to sew this together. You have to think about this process and sometimes laying it on the foam like this helps. We're going to sew this panel, this panel, in other words here, this together. We're going to sew this together, this and this. So that's one, two, three, four, five panels that will be sewn together separately. Okay. Now, we haven't put the channeling in this yet. That's going to be done. After that is sewn, these five pieces are sewn together. Then we will sew 
these pieces to the maroon piece here. Okay. We're not going to sew it together up here. We actually have to add a fabric pole up here on this piece so that we can pull it in between the two uh, layers of foam. Uh, we haven't cut the fabric pole yet, but that'll be a step as well. After this assembly is all sewn together, then we're going to sew this together here, this together here, and then there's a back um, kind of a triangular piece back here. I'm not going to roll it around because everything's kind of just pinned in place, but we will sew this starting here, coming up here, and then coming down this side to this. So these uh, four panels will be sewn together and then directly after that we're going to come to this end piece down here and then here now these would match up like that I would start here and sew this on and stop here okay so once that's on then what I would do is I would join this portion with this portion by starting here basically these two are matched up and sewing up making a 90 degree turn, oops, right up here, I'm sorry, and sewing these all together, including my fabric pole that I'll put on. And then everything is done. So we're gonna start by sewing these pieces as we discussed before. So we're gonna sew this to this. And one way to know where to stop sewing is to look at your old piece. So here's the old piece. And as you can see, it was sewing from here all the way to here, and we stopped sewing. So we're going to stop sewing right here. So let's remove these panels, and I'll show you what we're talking about. So I removed the two pins are holding each of these panels. So this panel will go over just like this and be sewing here down to there. And there's our K, and there's our K. So our matchup marks will be directly on top of each other, basically making this level with each other. Let's take this to the sewing machine. Okay, there's K, there's K. This uh, edge is lined up. Uh, K is not directly on top of each other. This, this edge being lined up is probably the most important, but we are gonna follow the contour of this all the way to here. Now we're sewing with a six millimeter straight stitch and we're gonna sew a half inch from the raw edges of the fabric. A little bit of reversing. Just making sure that the raw edges are lined up as I sew. I'm not pulling on one panel more than the other. If you need to make adjustments, you know, if you feel like you need to twist the fabric more to one location, lift the presser foot with the needle buried. Straighten it out a little bit more. And right here is where we're going to stop sewing and I'm going to do some reversing. Now notice that there's some wrinkles in this. Had I put some relief notches in this before I'd sew in, that would not have been as difficult to sew through. I'm putting relief notches now here so it can kind of relax. See how that allows the fabric to relax going around that curve. So now we're going to follow this same procedure with this side panel, sewing it on like this onto this panel. So here's our next panel and we can't sew this direction. We'd have to sew this direction. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this. These edges should be matched up because when you come across here, they're going to be straight, as you can see when you pull it open. So don't be alarmed of the fact that it's crooked like this. 
flip it. F is very close to F. It could be that I was slightly off a little bit. Don't worry about that. Let's just match up this edge. Okay. I'm going to dog ear this just a little bit like that, a little bit off, and start sewing. Do a little bit of reversing, and then match up the edges as we sew. I'm going to get it come around here and start to make this turn here. Following the one underneath, making sure there are no wrinkles in this as I sew through it. Should have my needle buried. Lift my presser foot a little bit, work out these wrinkles. There we go. And just like the other one, we're going to stop sewing here and do some reversing. We're once again going to cut some uh, relief slits in this to allow the fabric to kind of relax at this corner, going no deeper than our seam allowance. And that just allows it to relax in there. So now we'll sew this one to that one. So we're just going to be sewing with outside surfaces facing each other like this. We're going to take the pins off and take it to the sewing machine. Now if you want to confirm that you have the right panels, B goes with B. The matchup marks may not be directly on top of each other, and that's okay. We're going to go with, with the top line being uh, our reference. If it's sewing on like this, it'll come out straight like that. So now we have this sewn together, this gets sewn to this outside surfaces facing each other, A and A. Everything over here looks pretty good, except for at this one junction, and it's a teeny bit off. So when we sew, we could just basically match up edges and kind of sew across evenly. Or if you want, just take your scissors and kind of trim this off so that it's even. That way when you're sewing, you don't have to worry about the inconsistency. So there you go. Next up, sewing the top bolster. 
Okay, next up we're gonna sew these pieces together and we discovered that it'd be better to sew this piece here and all the way down to here. But to do that, the first step is to sew this one to this one. So we'll start here and we will sew it here and stop here. Then we'll sew these onto this with one complete stitch. So we're gonna take this one off and this one. So the, how does this get sewn onto that? Well, you just flip it like that. And you start at one of these corners and sew around. So we have in and in. They're not matched up, but they're very close to each other. That's what matters. Now when I get a half inch from here, I'm gonna stop with my needle buried. Just about there. And then I'm gonna lift my presser foot and I'm going to pull this fabric over to make this 90 degree turn. Like that. And then I'm gonna lower my presser foot, make sure that I'm not sewing through any of my fabric underneath and I'm not, I can feel it there and sew. Okay, on this side, we're pretty much perfect. It goes in a straight line. But when we go to this side, we're slightly off. We have a little bit too much fabric here. So because it's gonna be hard to sew straight down that, I'm gonna trim this off following the same contour that I have. It's not gonna be a big deal here because we're gonna pull this on nice and tight. So all I'm gonna do is kind of just ferret into this. There we go. So now we can just sew straight down. So this one gets sewn onto that one like that. So let's take this to the sewing machine. All right, here we are. This edge is matched up. This panel can go down a little bit like that. Mm-hmm. Follow that edge. Keeping the stitch a half inch from the raw edge as well, using the needle plate on the Sayrite Fabricator sewing machine. Not stretching the fabric at all. Here's a, here's a turn. Whoa, went a little bit far from a half inch. I'm just gonna correct slowly. Okay, we'll do the same thing with the next panel. So I put this back on here just as a reference for you. Take this panel, flip it like that, and it gets sewn to the remainder. Okay, this is a staple side, and this is a staple side too. See, it says staple on there. We don't really wanna start from a staple edge. We wanna start from 
the edge where it's going to be joined up to that maroon panel, which is this, which means I have to flip this assembly. So we'll start from this corner and sew down to the stapled edge because this corner has to be matched up. Okay, so now we sew this starting here and sew around here and we stop a half inch from this bottom edge here. So I've unpinned it and we will flip it like this and start sewing here. All right, oh, notice that I have to start with this on the bottom since I have to sew in this direction. The other side will have to sew with this on top. So we got to follow this curve down here. And we're going to cut a few relief notches into this top panel to go around this curve. The relief slits, I should say. This will just allow it to relax a little bit around the curve. Don't go deeper than your seam allowance. For us, it's a half inch. Really awesome slow speed control of the Sarat Fabricator sewing machine with the uh, Sarat Workhorse servo motor. Great package. We sell it in both a uh, standard package and a deluxe package. But we're gonna do the same thing here around this curve, make a few little relief notches it's probably not totally necessary to do this, but I believe it helps a little bit. Now when I'm doing this, I'm trying not to pull one fabric more than the other because I don't want any hard spots in it if I can avoid it. Because if you stretch one more than the other, you might get a hard spot. Now see we're coming close to the end of the fabric. I'm going to stop about a half inch. Which is right about there and do a little bit of reversing. Same process with this one. Pull the pin, flip this, start sewing here and all the way around. Now you can see this one's on top because we have to sew in this direction. I don't know which one's easier. It actually seems like it's easier on top, but sometimes it seems as easy when it's on the bottom side. I'm just pulling this panel around without stretching it. Kind of letting the sewing machine do the part of feeding it in.
whoa, got a little bit off there. Because I'm off, I'm gonna lift my presser foot and pull this fabric over. This might create a little bit of a hard spot here because of that. All right, sewing the panel on top is easier. <laughs> I'm going to stop about a half inch, do a little bit of reversing. Okay, now we're to the point where we have everything sewn together. We have not put the channeling in this. We're going to be doing that in a little future step. But we want to talk about to top stitch or not to top stitch. This is a four-way stretch vinyl and it is recommended that you top stitch a four-way stretch vinyl. With regular seeding vinyl, it's probably not necessary, but a top stitch also looks great. So how are we going to top stitch? Well, what we've decided is that we're going to have each one of the half inch tails go to the inside. So we're going to put a top stitch here and here. And we're actually only going to top stitch basically from here and then come around here and come around here. That's our preference. Here we're going to go to the inside. So it, basically every top stitch will be on the inside. Top stitch here, top stitch here and a top stitch here, top stitch here, okay? Let's just start with this panel. We're gonna top stitch here. So I'm gonna fold the tail back that direction and sew through it. Okay, when you're sewing a top stitch, the Serrat fabricator can take the edge guide foot. So I'm gonna install this foot in place of the standard foot. With this foot on, this is a, a guide that goes right along our first stitch. So this makes it easy for positioning of that top stitch. This makes uh, top stitching so easy and fun. So all I'm doing here is just pushing out the fabric, making sure the tail is over here. So we're sewing through the tail. Display the fabric out as you create your top stitch. When you get to transitions like this, just smooth the fabric out, whether it be one inch or two inches or less, all you're trying to do is smooth it out right before you sew. Notice I'm just pulling the fabric out as I'm trying to follow that very distinctive curve. And there's where we did our reversing, so I'm just going to do some reversing right there. This is underneath the chair. There we go. Okay, now we're just going to move to the next seam. Remember, we're putting the stitches to the inside, so that's where this stitch will go. Now this stitch will go to the, to the inside here, because this is the middle. Now, we're, since we're to the middle position, all I'm going to do is flip the panel around and start from the opposite end, following that same procedure.
Okay, we're starting at the stop position on the back side. This is the front side. We're starting here because of the fact that we're putting the top stitch on this side. So I'm gonna splay my tail and tuck it under the foot and start right where I did some back tacking there. We'll do a little bit of back tacking here, making sure that it looks pretty. One, two, reverse, one, two. That should look good. Now I gotta splay my fabric apart. There's a lot of shape here. Oh Lord, oh gee, I almost sewed through my fabric. I thought I'd sewed through it, but I didn't. So I had this tucked under here pretty deep. Be careful of that. I was close. Make sure I'm not sewing through any fabric I don't want to be sewing through. Make sure my tail's folded over right, and it is. It's gonna look great, I can tell already. And then do some reversing. So now we're sewing to the inside of this keystone shape at the top middle. And uh, it's pretty easy. Do a little bit of reversing. Boy, I love using this edge guide. It's awesome. You don't have to have an edge guide. If you've got the Serrat Ultra Feed sewing machine, it doesn't have an edge guide. Uh, it'll still work great for this. You just have to pay attention to where you're sewing. So my tail's here, and I'm getting ready to make this 90 degree turn, but my tail over here is, is right over here, and I may have to make a cut to allow that tail to flip to this side. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stop sewing here, and I'm gonna look at the underside. Okay, so here's my tail that I'm sewing through right now. And yep, see, just as I thought, it doesn't want to flip this way because it's basically a continuous tail. That's easy to resolve. All I need to do is, is cut a little slit in this to allow it to flip the other way. Don't go deeper than your seam allowance. And now this tail will begin to flip that direction. Here at the beginning, it's not gonna to want to flip much because of the fact that I didn't cut the slit too deep, but it will go that direction now. So here's a transitional bump, so you're gonna, we're gonna go slow there, but we still should have this sewing machine feed it beautifully through. I'm gonna just make sure that it doesn't get stuck. So I'm kinda helping the fabric through at this juncture. Okay, we're past it. Splaying the fabric apart left and right. Tails over here. I can feel it. A little bit of reversing. So here I'm starting at the bottom because we have to sew to the inside. 
or we want to sew to the inside. Do you have to? No. We're trying to make it look all the same. Same process here, then we'll show you what we do at the, at the top panel. Okay, had we uh, sew in our top stitches while we were sewing panels together, there would already be a top stitch in this. But since we didn't, this is an area where I'm going to have to do some reversing here and it's going to be visible. But it is to the back side of the cushion. And I'm not going to be sewing to the inside, I'm going to be sewing to the outside. This is the back of our pontoon corner bench. So I'm going to sew by lift, my foot, presser foot is lifted up and I'm going to bury my needle right on the past stitches. Just like that. And I'm going to lower my presser foot and I'm going to sew two stitches forward. One, two, and then I'm going to do some reversing. One, two. Okay, now I'm going to sew forward. My tail's over here. Now watch what I do when I get to the 90 degree turn. So here's all that balk fabric. There's my 90 degree turn. Mm -mm. So I'm going to splay out that 90 degree turn uh, basically to this edge that I'm sewing. There's a lot of balk fabric there. I'm going to try to flatten it. Try to pull my my fabric so that it's that it's uh, on the first stitch. Okay, I'm basically right at that 90 degree turn. My needle's buried. I'm going to lift my presser foot and I'm going to pivot this around a little bit so I can concentrate on the next run. Lower my presser foot. Don't forget to lower your presser foot. So now we're going down the other side. Then when I get to this junction, I'm going to stop sewing right into my previous stitches and do a little bit of reversing. There, I'm on that stitch. I'm going to hold it in reverse. Two stitches in reverse and two stitches in forward. Maybe three. And that's it. So that doesn't look too bad actually when you look at it like that. It almost looks like it got buried anyway. Sewing channeling into a curve is difficult. We're going to show you how it's done. Okay, now we're going to concentrate on putting the channeling in this. Now, often Pontoon seats don't have a strip that has channeling in it, so this is a rarity. But we did that with the other seats, so we're going to put channeling in this. This has some shape, so we have to do it a little bit differently. Okay, this is the bottom edge. This is the top edge. And if you look here, you can see this is a straight piece, so we want our lines to be perpendicular to it. This is straight, but here it's a totally different angle, so we want our lines to be perpendicular to that. And then this is straight. We want our lines to be perpendicular to this. Now at the ends, we're not going to worry about it, even though this is straight, it's a different angle than this. We're actually probably just going to carry our lines like this because it will follow the contour of the chair as far as being tilted back. And this is also the side that nobody will see. So where do we start? Usually channeling is just, you know, two inches, three inches, one and a half inches apart. And you just start and you, you strike lines and you sew it. But because this has all this shape, we need to start really in the center. So we want the lines to be uh, perpendicular to this edge, but we want to find the, where it makes a transitional change. And to do that, we want to use the clear acrylic ruler. We're marking on a seating vinyl, so chalk works phenomenally well, a, char a chalk pencil. You definitely want to have a wet rag because you may not like what you uh, get and you can make changes. That's the beauty of this. So don't worry about marking the fabric. The marks will come off beautifully. So I'm going to use this line here and I'm going to find where the transi transition starts or changes, which is right there. See if I went over here, the six would be up into the fabric. I go back here and the six 
or the nine, I guess that is, is right on the edge of the fabric and the 15 is. So this is uh, my transitional change. I'm gonna strike a line here. This line's gonna be erased later on. Then I'm gonna come over here to this transition and I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna make a perpendicular line right at the transitional change, which looks to be right about there. Strike a line. This line will be erased. So now we'll measure between those lines and we get uh, nine inches. So four and a half is our middle point. Now this line, I'm gonna, it's gonna be permanent. Not permanent, I can always erase it. But I want this line to be perpendicular to this edge right here. This is a straight edge. So use a clear acrylic ruler to do this. And once you strike the line, if you don't like it, erase it and do it again if it doesn't look to be straight. Yeah, that looks good. Now, from this line, I have enough, I think, to make my second mark because my channeling is going to be two inches apart. You can make it whatever you want. I'm going to put this at, on two inches. I'm going to put it on the line that we just struck. I can see through the clear acrylic ruler at my chalk, so I know this, this is the correct location. Okay, so now I'm going to do the same thing over here. Two inches on this side. Strike a line. Perfect. Now, I have to have a line that's crooked before I transition into this part. Remember, we're not going to be using this line. Okay. So at this bottom edge, I'm going to measure over two inches and I'm just going to put a mark there. At the top here, I'm going to try to split the difference here. So I have four and three quarter, so I want to go two and what? Two and what? Two point three seven five. So I want to go two point three seven five approximately, which is right there. Let's see if that looks good. If it doesn't, I can erase it. Now let's get rid of this because this is deceiving us. So I have a damp rag and see how beautifully it comes up. That's why I'm not worried about making marks and not liking it. Yeah, that actually almost looks like two inches. We know it's not because it has to transition into the next change. Let's go on and put an, a mark at two inches here and we're gonna make this one perpendicular to this edge because we're basically at our straightaway here and see if that looks good. So we were perpendicular, make a mark. Okay, so this, this could possibly be split. You see how we're deeper here? We have more fabric here. I'm gonna erase this one and I'm actually gonna put the line right here. I think that'll look better and I'll come down to here. So I think the line should be over here more so that we can split the difference of this. So I'm gonna measure that and see what I have. I have six inches. So I'm going to put the line at three inches, which should split the difference right there. I'm still at two inches down here. That looks good. That's a nice transition. Now we can make the lines all perpendicular to this one, just like we did at the other spots. So let's do that. Oops, boy, did that, that's a blunder. Okay, we've done two inches all the way over here and the ends, uh, I'm not gonna follow this. I'm gonna actually follow my two inch lines. This goes around the side and it'll curve to follow the same curve of the chair. So you'll see that after we're done. This is so foam or fabric back foam. You can see a light fabric on the back side. This means that when you sew it, the stitch won't pull through the foam because of the fabric backing. So you've got to make sure this fabric backing is laying down. I've placed my piece, my maroon piece for the channeling on top of the foam and I want to cut my foam large, but I don't want to spray more foam than I have to with spray glue. So I'm going to make an oversized piece like this and cut it to that size so that uh, I don't have to be very concerned about fitting it exactly and I don't have to spray too much foam.
Just cut it roughly. Okay, right now we're gonna move this out of the way. We're gonna first spray our uh, foam. And it, <laughs> because practice makes perfect, move this completely out of the way because you might get uh, glue on the wrong side. Now you don't have to coat this heavily. You just wanna coat all the areas that it could possibly rest so it doesn't move when you're sewing because we're not bonding it permanently. Though we are gonna coat the foam and also the backside of the vinyl. So we have marks on the backside of this. If we cover it with foam, we won't see them. So I'm gonna put snips where each mark is and I'm also gonna take a picture so that I know the numbers of each location Then the, then the snips are just little triangular pieces. Don't go deeper than your seam allowance at each one of these locations. Blue drying. Okay, just so you know, we're using foam lock spray adhesive. This is a great uh, adhesive for channeling applications like that. It's available at Sailrite. Now we're gonna coat the uh, vinyl, not with a heavy spray, just a fairly light one. And then we let it uh, tack up, which is a few minutes. When you feel it with your finger and it's sticky, then it's ready to bond. Okay, we're going to bond it to the foam, hopefully in the right spot. Mm, you can tell I'm a little bit off here. We're just trying to make sure we hit all the foam. Two people would help with this. I think I'll start at this end. Maybe that'll be better. Yeah, that's not the way to do it. <laughs> Finally, we got it in the right spot. Okay, remember at the ends we have some excess. They're not cut to the right sh shape or size. I'm using old scissors here um, and, because I don't want to get glue all over my, my good scissors and I'm cutting right along the edge of the vinyl. You can also use a rotary cutter to do this with a cutting mat on the bottom side. I think it's a little bit easier. You do have to press down pretty hard to get it to cut through it, the foam and the backing. Okay, so now we just have the simple task of sewing directly on top of our line. And I've already checked my tension in some scrap, which is really important because you don't want that knot to be pulled up to the top. Now, I have a half inch seam allowance on both sides. And I do want to try to do a little bit of reversing, but I don't want that reversing to show up. So I need to make sure my reversing stays a half inch inside the edge at both the top and the bottom. So I've got to do this very carefully at the beginning and the end. So one, two, and then in reverse, and then sew to the other side. Right on top of the chalk that we made. When I get to this side, I'm going to sew a little bit off and then I'm going to do a little bit of reversing. Okay, now I don't have to cut my stitches. My needle uh, is in, going in the up position, so my take up arm is up high up here, which means I'll be able to pull the thread easily through the tension assembly. I should be able to. There's a, quite a big, a bit of bulk fabric, so it doesn't want to move much. And I want to look at my stitch. It looks good. So now I'm going to just start sewing right here. Didn't even cut my threads. Do a little bit of reversing. And sew to the other side. When I get to here, I'll sew one stitch off and then reverse just a little bit. I'm going to roll the balance wheel around by hand till my take up arm is at the top lift my presser foot with my knee lever, and then uh, move on to the next one. Okay, we are done. 
and all we need to do is cut the trailers off of the uh, front side and also the back side. Since we locked everything in place, we shouldn't have any possibility of our stitches loosening up as we work with the material. So we'll do this down the entire run. And it looks really good. When you have foam that's high and low, you need a fabric pole. That's what we're going to show you how to do next. Okay, we're going to make our fabric pole. We haven't done that yet. Uh, we're going to make it the same length as this one. So I just mashed it up to this edge and I'll strike a line here. Now they have theirs really wide, but you can see the stapling happened really at about the three inch location, a little bit less than three inches. Our foam is three inches and our rule typically for cutting the width is thickness of foam plus one inch. We're gonna st steal a half inch for seam allowance and we're going to steal at least a half inch for the staples. So we're going to stick with our normal rule. Our foam is three inches for the bottom portion, so we're going to cut our fabric pole at four inches in width. Okay, now once we have that to the size we want, we're gonna mark another line a half inch up from that line. This could possibly be our staple line, or at least will give us staples in exactly the right spot because we can staple above it, because we can staple either above it or below it, depending on how tight we want it to be. And I'm probably gonna put it on two sides so I don't have to think about whether or not the line's on the right side or not. Now, I'm using a dimensionally sta stable fabric uh, this is Top Notch 9. You can use any fabric for a fabric pole. They use the vinyl that they were uh, fabricating. Uh, I love to use a polyester. It's dimensionally stable and strong, and I don't have to use a hot knife to cut it. This doesn't have to be perfectly straight here, but it should be fairly straight because you are going to be sewing it onto your panel. Okay, here's our old fabric, and you can see there's where the fabric pull started on this end. So we just lay it over the top because we didn't really mark that. And we should be able to tell by laying this on here. Yep, but the fabric pull I believe it starts there. Yeah, right there. So I'm going to mark the vinyl at that location and over here. Then I'm going to move this out of the way, the old one. So here's our old fabric pole. They obviously made slits because there's shape there. I'm not going to cut it yet. I'm just going to mark that that was where a slit was generally located. And then I'll cut it later. The fabric pole gets sewn to the top side. This is the top side. I'm going to flip it so now the top side is facing you and it'll get sewn on. This is the up edge or top side of our vinyl. I want the fabric pole to be sewn on this edge but on the underside. So I'm going to flip this. So again, this is the top edge, underside, and I'm going to make my half inch mark be the bottom. So it's going to be like this. Okay, so we want it to start basically right there at our pin line. So we're going to just put it right there across from that and we're going to sew a half inch inside this edge all along this edge. So we, we have shape in this. So we're going to follow that shape and just keep it a half inch from the edge. Actually, I, I'm not going to do a half inch because a half inch is where we're going to sew uh, our next panel to this. I'm going to go very close to the edge very, very close to the edge. So I don't see this stitch. So basically this foot's going to be right along the edge.
We're going to sew all the way to the mark and then we're going to stop. Now we'll sew panels together. So we've sewed the fabric pull to the top side. This is the bottom side. So we're going to use seam stick basting tape for canvas and upholstery along the bottom edge and get it very close to the raw edge of the fabric. Why am I using this? Well, I can position my panel exactly where I want it. And if I don't like it, I can peel it up and reposition it. And I know that when I take it to the sewing machine, I'm not going to stretch one more than the other after I get it basted in the appropriate spot. Now I already removed the uh, transfer paper revealing the double sided tape. And what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to actually match it up to this, this, uh, these seams that are slightly askew, which I think is, it's nice that I can't really tell. Oh, this and this, right? So yeah, no, it's this and this. So, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to baste it starting at the middle there, right along the edge. And if anything, I'm going to pull this uh, pleated panel more than I am the top. So I'm going to work to one side, matching up the edges and basting them down. I'm pulling a little bit with my hand down here on the channeled fabric. I could shrink up one fabric more than the other if I want. I don't really want to do that too much because you can cause wrinkling. And my marks are a little bit off over here, but as we discussed earlier, that's not too cr crucial. I might just pull a little bit more on this panel just to stretch it a teeny bit. Not the top panel. Yeah, that almost made our marks come together just by doing that. It's amazing what you can do with that. You just don't want wrinkles in the assembly. Now there's my first mark. It looks like it's almost going to come together pretty good. I got everything laying pretty flat. No real wrinkles as far as I can tell. So that's pretty good. If I did get something off, if something, did, something didn't look right, I could just peel it back up and rebaste it again. So my L's almost on top of my notch for my L on that panel below. My four is almost perfect on that uh, notch. And my J is very close. That looks pretty good. So now we want to check to make sure that we don't have any serious wrinkles and we want to Press it together to make sure it's bonded well. Once we're happy, we can take it to the sewing machine and we can sew it. Make sure you're happy with it because once it's sewing on, I mean, you can always take it off again, but you don't really want to. Okay, we're going to sew a half inch from that edge. And everything's basted down. Just make sure it stays basted as you sew. So occasionally what I'll do is I'll stop with my needle buried and look to see that everything's basted and it is. But we'll continue on. There's some shape in this so I'm following the contour.
we're just going to continue on down until we reach the other end and do some reversing. We changed the standard foot out and put the edge guide in uh, for the Sarah Fabricator sewing machine because we're going to put a top stitch in. So my tail here is uh, going to be facing that direction. So I'm going to sew through that, make sure that it's flat, and put our top stitch here. You don't have to put a top stitch in. We just think it looks better. And also, because we're using a four-way stretch, it keeps these uh, needle holes from being exposed when the fabric is pulled taut. Looks good. I'd like to see that if I'm sewing through the other side, but I can't see yet. We're just going to continue along this whole length kind of pulling the fabric left and right so that we're on that first stitch. We're doing the exact same thing. We're putting double-sided tape on this, the top edge, just like we did at the bottom edge, so we can secure that panel right where we want it. We're going to peel off the transfer paper, revealing the double-sided or seam stick. Okay, this panel, this is the bottom edge of it. This is the back edge. So we're gonna start at this position here because we know that this is the center of that transitional shape there. So that's a perfect sp spot to line it up. So there's my middle stitch. There's my middle of my panel. I'm gonna baste it there and see if I'm happy. I'll baste to one side see how close we are to the matchup marks. We're a little bit off here. So again, I'm going to do the same sort of thing. I'm going to kind of stretch this channeling fabric as I baste this to it. I can kind of do that with my hand down here. You may not notice it, but I am stretching the channeling, which helps a little bit. They don't have to be right on top of each other. They were guides more than anything else. Okay, now we'll start at the center and go the other direction and see what we think. See how the channeling's bubbling up here? That's why I'm going to put my knuckles on it and I'm going to stretch it a little bit and not stretch the top panel. It's normal for channeling to kind of shrink up a little bit as you sew. That almost gets me directly on top of that mark. You can see here, the marks are almost directly on top of each other. So I'm taking my knuckles and I'm pulling the channeling, basting the top panel. This mark's not directly on top of itself, but it's very close. on this one, but we'll see what we get in the end. May have to do some stapling here. I'm going to put some staples in this just so that we can inspect to see where this edge is landing before we start sew anything. It's the only way to really hold it together to inspect it all well. And this area has a lot of shape to it. So I'm stapling well, well outside the seam allowance. I've got three staples here. I'm going to put some over there. Okay, so after we've stapled it in place to make sure that it stays in place, we can actually turn this right side out and inspect it before we sew to make sure that this panel is going to come down and basically be in line with this bottom panel. Now remember, we have extra here. So am I happy? Let's see. Yes, I think so. Look at that. It's going to come down. We're going to steal a half inch seam allowance. It looks like we're just about right. 
here. If anything, we can always trim off some of this, but I don't think we need to. Now on the other side, I think this fabric needs to be pulled more. We can see here the G is supposed to be here. This is just way too far off. So I need to pull more on the channeling. Let's see if the Q is off as much as the G. Yeah, Q's not bad, but again, we're gonna pull some fabric out of this. So I'll probably start here and I'm gonna take my knuckles and pull on the channeling fabric and not pull on the top fabric. In fact, I'm gonna actually kind of create very small wrinkles in the top fabric to try to shrink up that one slightly. I don't wanna to create too big a wrinkles because then they'll be visible in the end results. So I'm pulling on the channeling and not pulling on the top. Let's see what kind of results we get after that. Now look at that, see G is much closer now, which is what I like. It's only off by a little bit now. So there are ways to manipulate your panel a little bit to get more, uh, especially after doing channeling like this. Now I'm going to staple it in the three or four spots, turn it right side out and inspect it to make sure I'm happy with it. So now let's see what we got here. Turn it right side out. We have extra, extra fabric here, but will this come down and meet up with the other one when we take out our half inch seam allowance? I believe it will. Look at that. We're pretty close there. Okay. The way you know is if you follow this stitch, this is our, our stitch line, you can kind of just eyeball it and it should fall about the halfway point here for a half inch seam allowance and it does. So I think we're in great shape. Now because there's quite a bit of shape here and we shrunk up the fabric in a few spots here, I'm going to staple it together just to make sure that when I take it to the machine, I don't lose what I intended. So I'm actually putting a staple about every, what, eight inches or so. And we can pull these out after we're done sewing. Okay, remember that half inch we left unsewn? Well, this is why. There's our half inch there. We put our foot down and we sew a half inch from the raw edges. Mm, lots of fabric. Now we're sewing through this uh, tail on the underside too, so our stitch is going to be well within that first stitch that we created because we're a half inch from the edge, which is exactly what we want. It's not going to show up. The maroon channeling, if you remember, we left a, a little bit long, so we have to trim this off. And the way to do that is we're going to splay this out so that it lays fairly flat on the table here. And we're going to go, hopefully these are in line with each other, this panel and this panel, and they are, you can see that here. So we're just going to use a straight edge and uh, connect the two panels together with a straight line here. So just like that. So we'll trim this excess away. This gives us our half inch for seam allowance. As you can see here, that's a half inch for seam allowance. I want to trim this without cutting into my fabric on the underside. There we go. And we'll do the same thing on the opposite side. Okay, so we've already sewn a top stitch here. So this is a little bit difficult to sew, but it's not that hard. I'm going to show you how to do that. So I'm looking at my old pattern piece down here. This is the same what we patterned this one from. And you can see that uh, we will sew it obviously from here all the way down. And then they stop sewing here. So I'm going to stop sewing 
Uh, let's see if that's correct. Yeah, I'm going to stop sewing right here. I'm not going to go around this corner just because that's what they did here. So I always like to save these to see how they made it. Okay, so here is our preliminary stitch on the inside and the top stitch is on the outside. That's normal. You'll always see the top stitch on the outside. So you, we want to start sewing from the inside here. Um, and we want to try to sew over top of those previous stitches just by at least a stitch or two. And I lower my foot. Oops, it's already locked. I'm going to lower the foot lock lever. There we go. Now I can use my knee lever. And I'm going to start sewing right here. So we're going to splay this down and sew over the top of that. I may have to make sure it gets under the presser foot. Do a little bit of reversing. And sew through half inch from the raw edge. Making sure there's no excess fabric on the underside. There is not. Matching up the edges. There's some shape in this. You can see I'm keeping it at a half inch, as close as possible. See the shape in here? So we're going to follow that shape. And we'll do some reversing here. Okay, now we'll do the same thing to the other side. Okay, so now we'll turn it right side out and we'll do our top stitch. Okay, we gotta do the same thing on this side. So, except for we're working, I think we had the foam on top last time, now the foam's on the under, underside. Because we have to start, start from where the transition from where the uh, seam was last sewing. We can't start at the bottom edge. Match it up. Make sure they don't have any excess fabric underneath there. I don't, I think I can feel it. And I need to be a half inch inside that edge. I'm actually gonna start down away from that a little bit because my top stitch is gonna basically secure it right there. Match up the edge and sew it. Whoa, something stuck. And that should be where we stop. For this top stitch, we have to start at the bottom, everything's sewing together, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, and we're going to sew a top stitch on this side, just the same as it is up here. You can see it here. Um, we are not gonna put the edge guide on for this. You don't really have to have the edge guide, it makes it pretty nice, but uh, 
you'll see here in a second that you can just use a standard foot and achieve almost the same results. So don't feel like you have to buy a foot. I'm going to keep that stitch in about the same distance away from the first stitch. Do a little bit of reversing there. Display my fabric out left and right as I sew, following the shape. Make sure I'm not sewing through any excess fabric on the underside. That would be a big no-no. You can kind of feel it. Make sure there's no fabric on the underside. When there's lots of shape like this, you just want to work with small sections at a time. Make sure your tail's pushed out um, so you're sewing through the tail. We are. Now we're sewing through all that foam, so I'm kind of helping push the assembly in because I want to make sure it feeds consistently. We're almost to the junction of the previous top stitch. Now it's a little bit odd, you know, that's not uncommon when you're switching from one top stitch to the other, which is a practice I don't like doing, but we almost have to here. So now we're into the previous top stitch and I'm just gonna do a little bit of reversing here. And there we go. Stapling the fabric pull in place is next. Okay. The silk film is going to be wrapped over this foam. Now this piece is not glued and it should be removed because we need to staple down the fabric pole. So I have, I actually have two layers of silk film, one here and one over there, but it's a center fold material. You can uh, find the other side just by doing this with your fingers and then unsplay it so it's 54 inches wide. So I've put plenty of silk film over the top of our frame. That foam is removed. This foam's glued on. I don't want to unglue it and re-glue it, so I'm going to leave it in place and I'm going to lay my cover in here and I'm going to start at the center, making sure that the center is right where it needs to be and start stapling the fabric pole right close to this foam. Okay, here's where we marked where the slits were put before because this, this is, has some shape, so we have to cut some slits into this to allow the fabric pole to stretch here. I'm going to do it based on the seam. So basically down from that here, right about there, and I'm gonna cut a slit here. And then I'm gonna go follow this seam and cut a slit there. Okay, so that allows this shape to be built in. Okay, it's important to know how this assembly gets put on. And I'm gonna unsplay it a little bit here. I'm, I'm concentrating on the fabric pole, that's why that's exposed but you want to check to make sure that when it's folded the right way out that uh, this is the bottom and this is the top and it is. So I'm going to fold it in half along the fabric pole as we were here and this fabric pole will basically get stapled deep into this area right on that half inch line. So right there. But we're going to start here as we talked about. So we know that this seam is the center so that means that this stitch here in the pleat and this stitch here should be centered between the shape of this area. So if I put my fabric pole right there, that should work perfectly. Now I need to get my staple gun. And now I'm going to make sure that it's centered in this little corner. And get it as close to the foam as I possibly can. That looks pretty good. I'm using a long nose staple gun so I can get in there, which is kind of important for this. If I had the short nose, it'd be a little bit more difficult. Good reason to buy the long nose. If I get my first couple staples in here, then it should be a lot easier. Do I like the spot? Yes, it looks like it's centered in that corner. 
I think I'm happy with that. Now we'll work out from the center going right and then we'll go left and we'll play staples about every six inches or so. We're going to temporarily staple this in place. Then if we're happy, we'll play staples closer. Yep, missed the board. You may also notice that we're a little bit inside that half inch line. We thought it looked better. Once the preliminary staple's in place, pull your fabric over and inspect okay, it. Okay, this is the time to inspect it um, because this is the only time you're going to be able to get to this fabric pull. Notice there's some wrinkles in here and this will be pulled out when we do the tensioning of the fabric down here. Okay, I think I'm pretty happy with this. So I am going to go ahead and secure my fabric pull by putting staples very close together. Okay, so we're happy with the position of this, and so I'm just going to put staples almost right next to each other. We'll do this all along the run. Okay, we're going to wrap this uh, lower now piece. Now we get to staple the new film. fabric to Which the backer is a preventative board for water frame. getting to the foam and it also more importantly for an upholstery project like this makes it easy for us to pull the vinyl down over the sticky foam because the backing of the fabric a vinyl fabric almost all of them is not very forgiving uh, when it comes to gripping the foam the silk film makes it so easy it's almost impossible without it Okay, just overlapped the silk film, wrapped it around to the back side, um, and make sure that everything's covered nicely. And we fit this back in here. We're using our old foam, as we discussed earlier. And I'm not going to glue this in place. I'm going to just push this into this. I'm going to have to push it into this when I put the cover over the top. So anytime there's a shape like this, you want to try to put your fingers on the ends of the seams as you're pulling the vinyl over the, all the foam and everything. That way if there's any stress that's on it, it doesn't accidentally rip on you. Well, that goat went over pretty easily. So we'll just start covering the whole thing. Good. Oops, look at our foam's coming out. Like I said before, we're going to have to push it in there. So what's our first staple when it comes to securing the vinyl in place? Well, I'm going to put this corner right on the corner of the wood and pull the seam down so it's along the edge here. And I believe that my staple will go on the bottom corner side over here, my staples. I'm going to put a few of them there. So I'm just trying to find that corner and make sure that fabric is in the corner and make sure that my seam is pulled down so that corner looks good. Yeah, that looks good. So I'm just pulling it taut, making sure my seam's where I want it, tucking the fabric underneath here. So now we're going to work on this side, and I'm going to get these wrinkles out of the back just by pulling the vinyl taut like this, making sure that everything looks good making sure this seam is kind of at the corner, and it is. 
And I'm going to put a few staples here. See if I like it. I think I do. Okay, we're going to tension it here a little bit. Put a couple staples in. Now let's turn it over and see what it looks like on this side. So I believe this can be pulled out by pulling it downward. So let's see if that works. So we can work the vinyl down like this, kind of pressing it down. Yeah, that's definitely an improvement. So I'm gonna turn it over and so I can look at both sides while I do this. So we have a slight wrinkle here and we also think we can pull this down further. If you look at the back here, a little bit of wrinkles here. So I'm gonna remove these two staples. That's why we don't staple it everywhere yet. And this is a great staple puller um, that Sayrite sells. I highly recommend it for any upholstery job like this. Now what we'll do is we'll pull down on the vinyl to kind of work out any of these inconsistencies and also pull the vinyl down a little bit more towards the bottom of the chair. So we're going to work on this end here. I'm going to tip it up and I'm going to look to make sure that I get a pleasing look as I pull taut on the vinyl. I'm going to put a couple staples in, see if I'm happy. Yeah, that looks good. So we have these two sides attached and I'm going to concentrate on this area. There's a fabric pull here, so we aren't going to be able to affect this because it's basically being tensioned from here up. So all we have to concentrate on is making sure this looks good. Hopefully when we go to the back, we'll be able to work this out. So right now I'm just going to put preliminary staples in here, looking for a good look at this juncture. I think I'll start here. I'm going to put two staples in each spot. That way I don't have the vinyl ripping on me. Okay, we have a little bit of a wrinkle here. I'm gonna remove these two staples and pull it slightly that direction to get rid of those small wrinkles. Now let's see if we can get rid of them by pulling a little bit on the vinyl to go that direction. Wow, it's hot. See these wrinkles here? They can be removed by actually drawing the fabric around to the back side like this. Now we haven't stapled it over here either, so that'll help a little bit, but the more we do this to the back side and pull the fabric down here and staple it underneath, the more of this will remove these wrinkles here. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna remove these staples and draw it up tight here. Might even remove some of them under here. Okay, so see the wrinkles here? So I'm gonna take my hand and I'm going to work them and pull from the back side as I push the vinyl around to the back side, hopefully working them out. Now I'm only going to staple in uh, two spots back here. 
three times just to hold it and then I'm going to see if there's anywhere else that I can draw it up tight. Boy, it looks a lot better that way. That's looking much better. Okay, so now we're happy with the preliminary feel. We have a wrinkle here that we're going to work out with some steam. Uh, and hopefully we'll get that out completely. Now we just need to staple around the perimeter. Drawing it tight because everything's in place. Here at this corner up here, I mean, if this seam didn't land exactly where I want it to, probably because the foam is a little bit old, but the, again, this is up against something so you don't see it. And there's also a seat that goes in here. So all I'm going to do is just tack down this corner. And if I need to cut away some of the fabric, I can do so. But I don't believe I do. So we just keep doing this all around the perimeter. Then we'll just trim some of the excess away on the bottom side. So you can see we allowed the uh, vent holes in the bottom to be exposed so that it can breathe from the inside. Now let's work on this wrinkle. We're going to remove some of the wrinkles with hot steam. One of the best ways to do this is with a steamer like this. Um, just heat up the vinyl and the steam kind of keeps it from melting and then start working out the wrinkle. In fact, you can steam some of the vinyl that's away from the wrinkle and that seems to help work it out as well. And this does take some time and patience. You don't want to heat it to the point where you can cause damage. But working it with your fingers and heating it up will get those wrinkles out. You can see how bad they are. Hopefully at the end, they're going to disappear. So we'll have a comparison from when we started to when we ended. Anytime you heat a vinyl fabric, you have to be careful about not applying too much heat in that it might melt the vinyl or discolor the vinyl. So you need to do this carefully and hopefully it won't cause any problems with the vinyl losing its texture or losing its color. Now you can see here at four times the speed, it's actually disappearing almost completely as I work the vinyl and use the hot steam. One of the advantages of using the hot steam is that typically it doesn't allow the vinyl to melt or the surface on the vinyl, which is textured, to disappear. That looks so much better. There are a few more spots which could benefit from the hot steam. We're not going to show the rest of them on camera. And here it is. The backrest is complete. Now all we have to do is make the seat and the base that it rests on. We'll have two different videos that will show that process. Click the link at the top right if you'd like to see those. Don't go away, the materials list and the tools list that was used in making this corner pontoon bench seat are coming right up. We used a great marine seating vinyl that's called Eversoft. It's only available through Sayerite and it's a four-way stretch vinyl. Believe it or not, it only took five yards to complete the backrest, the seat, and the base of this bench seat. It doesn't take much. If you have any questions about the products or the tools that we used, feel free to call us or email us. We're glad to help. I'm Eric Grant, and from all of us here at Sayerite, thanks for watching.